Class number 10 in the course, Basic Christianity. <clears throat> We're sp spending a number of weeks talking about the gospel. I don't suppose it would be um, strange for any of you to, uh, to hear that Christianity is about the gospel. And if you don't get the gospel right, you don't get Christianity right. If you get Christianity right, you get the gospel right. So Christianity is about Christ, it's about God's saving work in Christ, which forms the gospel. So uh, tonight we're going to continue our several weeks talk on the gospel as Christianity presents it to be. Tonight we'll talk about regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. I'll give a brief introduction to uh, this topic this evening after I have a word of prayer and then we'll continue our study together. Heavenly Father, we beseech your mercy to understand the truths that you have revealed in your word. And we long to understand the gospel as you have taught it to be in the scripture. We value the gospel as a great treasure of life. Bless our time together this evening as we think together thoughts that we trust come from your word. And help us to live in the view of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ is essentially about how God saved sinners in Christ and through his saving work. So the whole concept of salvation is in view when we're talking about the gospel. So you want to get this concept of salvation, God saving sinners. Now, it's very important that we mention it that way because it is inaccurate to describe salvation as something that sinners do for themselves. Sinners do not save themselves, nor can individual people save other individual people. God has to save the sinner. So we are thinking together, uh, as we talk about the gospel, about God's saving work in, in Christ. Tonight, I have in view the aspect of God's saving work in Christ in the gospel that pertains to human experience. So keep that in mind. When we're talking about this part of the gospel we are asking the question, what's it like, what, what's, what sort of experience does a person have when that person gets saved? <clears throat> so it's, a, it's about human experience. Thus, tonight we will not think together about justification. Although justification is pivotal and core to the gospel, I am setting that aside for next week by itself. Because justification really is not a part of human experience. It, it, is, it occurs in the mind of God about the sinner who believes in Christ. Thus, it, it's a change of divine perspective of the believer. But it, it is not about the human experience. However, that's not to say that being saved does not have human experience aspects to it. Certainly it does. Thus, tonight's talk. And furthermore, I am I'm choosing a rather ambitious target in three parts. Regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. 
And if you know anything about these particular terms, uh, you are wondering how in the world can he talk about all three of those in one night? I'm not sure I can. We'll try to do the best we, that we can. But we're going to be thinking together about human experience in being saved in the terms of regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. There is a unifying theme in these three, and yet there is obviously, I think it's obvious, a distinctive quality uh, that separates these three words. Thus, salvation in human experience uh, must be uh, differentiated uh, on various planes regarding what it means to be saved. Simply put, we could identify the saving work of God in human experience on a timeline and say with these words regeneration, sanctification, and glorification, uh, salvation is having been saved. That's in the past. If you are saved, that's in the past. Certain aspects of this has already occurred. You are being saved at the very present time. There's a present tense way in which God is working salvation in your life. And there's a futuristic tense. You will be saved. And as we shall see tonight, uh, those three uh, tenses all connect under the heading of salvation. Those who have been saved are being saved and will be saved. We'll think about that in the terms regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Now let's begin by asking the question, what do these terms mean? <clears throat> regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Let's begin with regeneration. This term is a word that is a synonym to the expression, born again. And if you have your Bibles, and we've read this, I'm sure, many times together. In fact, I referred to it this morning. Uh, I want to look at John chapter 3. In fact, I read this a portion of this passage to you this morning. <clears throat> uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And Jesus looks into the heart of this man, Nicodemus, and he, though this man is a religious man, he is a religious leader, he has been trained in the rabbinical schools of the day, Nicodemus has a problem. And his problem is that he is not born again. And Jesus talks about that. In John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, this man cannot understand what does it mean. He heard the words born again, and he misinterpreted them to mean you have to be physically born all over again in order to get right with God. Uh, but Jesus explains uh, that in verses 6 and 7, uh, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So when he speaks of being born again, he's not talking about fleshly birth. He's talking about spiritual birth. Verse 7, do not be amazed, I said, you must be born again. The, those who are uh, saved are those who are born of the Spirit. I will only leave this for a later discussion, but it is very important that we come to understand that uh, to be born again means to be born by the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit causes you to be born again. I was preaching that this morning from John 6, 63, where Jesus says, the Spirit gives life. And so it's th this new birth experience. Uh, there's a death to an old life. There's a resurrection to a new life. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. By the power of the Holy Spirit. In the words of 1 Corinthians 12, we are born, we are baptized into the body of Christ. 
us, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit dwells within us. Now, what's important to see here is that this is a ministry of the Holy Spirit, in which the Holy Spirit Himself comes into the human soul, bringing the life of Christ with Him. Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. However, the Holy Spirit comes emanating from Christ to bring His life to us in a new birth experience. It is a change of magnanimous proportion. It is a cessation of being what you were before you trusted Christ. And it is a resurrection to a brand new life. Now this is... This is an instantaneous work of of the Holy Spirit in the soul. It's an instantaneous. That's a very important idea to append to this idea of regeneration. It is in a moment of time. If we were to put it on a board, if we were to represent a time, the time of regeneration, we'd put a dot there. Because... It's a punctiliar moment in time. Now, having said that, it is true to also say that leading up to regeneration could take months or even years. There's a process leading up to that moment. We're not dealing with that tonight. That's getting more into the experience of of the Holy Spirit's working to bring us to a moment of regeneration. But when that new birth experience occurs, it's instantaneous, it's immediate, and it is never again reproducible. You cannot be born again over and over and over and over again. And so this is really, really important. Regeneration, rebirth. Now, distinctive from that is the word sanctification or the concept of sanctification. Now, sanctification in a biblical context can talk about, we could talk about two types of sanctification. Most commonly, uh, the second type is what we mean, and that's what we're talking about here. There is positional sanctification and there is progressive sanctification sanctification. Now the reason there are two types that we can think of in sanctification is because the word itself can mean two different things. Um, uh, By the way, the word sanctification, you'll you'll see this in the New Testament uh, in the word sanctify or to be made holy because the word itself can mean to be set apart. To be set apart. Apart, <clears throat> and one could one could argue in a New Testament context that when one is born again, there is also a sense in which God sets that person apart for Himself. Uh, this is this is tied up in the idea of of uh, being born again because you have been bought by the blood of Christ. I recall. 1 Corinthians 6, 20, where Paul is arguing about honoring God with your body, right? Use your body to God's glory. And then he, he, he puts that in the idea of you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Well, what was the price that was paid to purchase me? That price was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, he shed his blood to buy every child of God, every believer in his blood. And that's the idea in redemption. The word redemption means to be purchased. And the purchase price is the blood of Christ. When that's applied in redemption, in salvation, you are instantaneously in regeneration set apart. So that part of sanctification is identified with regeneration although it it deals with a different aspect of it. However, that's not what we're talking about in sanctification tonight. We're talking about the other type of sanctification, and that's progressive 
progressive sanctification. Those who are born again and set apart then enter into a phase called progressive sanctification that begins at regeneration and continues all the way through one's earthly life. You never get finished with it. This part of sanctification can never be used in the past tense. Like, have you been sanctified? No, no. It's, are you being sanctified? Are you in the process? It's always in the present tense. It is identified as a number of, of things. Uh, it is identified as growth in godliness. Uh, you understand, do you not, that when you are born again, when you're regenerated, you're not instantaneously made perfect. You are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, and God sees you as perfect. That does not mean you are experientially perfect. We must understand. But that perfection, which is positionally yours in Christ, is now being worked out in your human experience in sanctification, in progressive sanctification. And it's a messy process. You have good days, you have bad days, you obey, you disobey, you sin, you obey the Lord, but there's a growingness in godliness. Peter talked about it as growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul will describe this progressive sanctification in Romans 6 as mortification of the flesh or the principle of sin in one's life. And he uses language of, of war. You go to war fighting against sin in your experience. Um, Romans 7 some will try to argue in Romans 7, uh, and we're not going to read it, but I would highly commend you to think about it in, after this talk tonight. But Paul is talking about himself. And it's, it's a very disconcerting <laughs> chapter because he says things like, the things I, I ought to do, I don't do. And, and the things I ought not to want to do, I do those things. Uh, and, and he culminates this dichotomy with, oh, wretched man that I am. <laughs> who, uh, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Some will try to argue because they're very uncomfortable with, the, with Romans 7 in the human experience of one being sanctified. That this is Paul before he is converted. I do not believe that is so. I believe Romans 7 is a description of a man growing in sanctification. In Romans 6, he's taking the knife of faithfulness to his sin. He's battling it. He fails miserably. God works in his life. And it's very important that we have a biblical perspective of that. When you are when you're regenerated, you do get a new nature. However, God does not eradicate the sin principle in your human experience. In other words, He doesn't remove from your human experience your sin principle, which was a part of your sin nature. He gives you a new nature. You're a new creature in Jesus Christ, but you're still going to have to fight the battle of sin in your life. And when I talk to people, and as I do, uh, on occasion, they'll say, why, why can I not win more battles? Why am I failing so much? By the way, I'm always encouraged by that because it's only godly people who want to be godly. <laughs> Ungodly people don't want to grow in godliness. They don't worry about it. And I, so the very fact that you're concerned about godliness and you want to be godly and you want to be obedient is an indicator that you are a Christian. It's a battle. And as your pastor, I want to help you not get overly discouraged by fighting that battle. It is normal. It is natural. 
It is not only normal and natural, it is necessary. You've got to fight the battle. And uh, we're not here to talk about the particulars of that sanctification experience. Only simply to say, this is part of what it means to live the Christian life. It's to grow. It's to battle. It's to continue on in Christ's service. That's why the, whole, the, the New, New Testament talks about discipline and self-control. It talks about the Christian life as an athlete. Training about a soldier fighting a battle. About a farmer working hard sowing seeds. This is hard work. Um, Philippians 2, I'm, I'm going to read this passage because I, I do not think that there is a better passage of Scripture to describe progressive sanctification than two verses in Philippians 2. And I, I heartily commend these verses to you. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, the beloved, uh, this is the group of people who are saved. They're beloved of God. They are God's people. So he's talking to Christians. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And this is the part of verse 12 that really throws some people. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, I, I know that Paul, and this is Paul writing, but doesn't he say in Romans that we cannot work to be saved? Oh, he's not, he's not saying you work to be saved. Look, look at the verse again. He says, work it out. You're already saved. You're working out what is already in. in your, so this is a passage about sanctification, not regeneration. This is not how you're born again. This is how you're sanctified. This is your present. you got to go to war. you got to work hard. And that, that word work there is, is arduous toil. This, this word has sweat on the brow. You've got to go, go to work. It takes Bible reading. It takes prayer. It takes going to church and, and putting up with Dr. Griever's sermons. And it's, it's confessing your sin and belching the garbage out of your heart. And it's really getting after it. Then verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse 12 has sweat on it. Verse 13 is peace and calm. God, you're working hard, but God is working in you to make this work happen. Okay? So there's, uh, one might use the term collaboration, uh, but it's, it's, it's really not so much that. It's God. God is causing the work, but it's manifested in your obedient response to Him. And I think people that get off base on sanctification either get verse 12 wrong or verse 13 wrong. Uh, those who believe you have to hold on to your salvation, if you don't, you're going to lose it. They believe verse 12. You've got to work to hold on to this, but they don't believe verse 13. God is at work in you, both to will and to do. And then there are those who say, oh, it's just coming to Christ and letting go and letting God just relax. And there's no work in the Christian life. You just, you just float along. They don't believe verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear. You have to be balanced and understand what is being taught here. This is progressive sanctification. So we have regeneration. We have sanctification. Now let's put glorification in the mix. And we're just dealing with these terms. Glorification is the future part of your salvation. God is going to save you. You who are already saved, you who are being saved, God is planning to finish the job. Now we're talking about human experience. 
Look at Philippians 1 and verse 6, which I think is, is a good passage on this, and there are several. But Paul, writing to Philippians, says the following, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, it's very interesting because uh, all three tenses seem to be involved here. He began the work, and he performs it. So beginning the work is regeneration. Performing it is sanctification. And then there's the promise that the day of Christ Jesus will come in which he will continue it to that day. The implication is he will finish the work. So there is really a connection between all three of these terms and concepts and sanctification. Therefore, I'd like to pose this question. What is the connection between all three of these terms as they relate to human experience in the saving work of God? So in responding to that, let me suggest to you that there's a unity between these three terms and a distinction as well. The unity is that all three of these terms connect to Christ and to those who are in Christ. They're various components of the saving work of God to those who have come to Christ. It relates to divine grace, this unifying grace, the grace that regenerated you, the Holy Spirit, used the Word of God. We talked about that this morning. But He also graciously gave you the life of Christ, and worked to save you. But he also gives you grace to continue growth and sanctification. And it's going to be grace that will finish this job in glorification and bring you home. Uh, now, we must say that uh, gl this ending, this glorification, this final phase of the process uh, ends when Jesus Christ comes back. We might suggest uh, well, isn't it true to say that when a Christian dies, uh, they go home to heaven and there's a finishedness there? Absolutely, that is, that is true. There's a spiritual sense in which there is no further thing to give. When you go to heaven, there's no more to add than what you have there, except your resurrected body. And so we might suggest, and we sometimes will call this the intermediate period, uh, that you, the soul is in heaven waiting on the resurrection. You're awake, you're alive, you know what's going on, but there's still that finishedness in which even your mortal flesh will take upon uh, the facsimile of Christ's heavenly body, and you will be molecularly restructured and have a heavenly body, as in Paul's description in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. The unity is the saving work of God in Christ by His divine grace experienced by God's uh, people. Now, this unity has a connection to it. And it's a sequential connection. These three ideas, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, uh, they are different, but they are linked Regeneration is incomplete without sanctification. And by the way, a lot of Christians don't know that. That if you have been regenerated, you must be sanctified. You must be in the process of sanctification. Uh, these are those, and uh, the person was talking to me about it this morning. You bring this up a lot, he said, about just not praying the prayer and getting in, and then that's it. I said, I know that. And the reason is because the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible says if you are regenerated, you, you're going to walk with Jesus. Because that's what faith is, and that's what the saving work of God is about. It's about getting you in and keeping you in. And so it, it can be described as perseverance of the saints. It can be described as the process of sanctification. Thus, regeneration is the beginning of sanctification. Sanctification is the continuation of regeneration. In regeneration, you're changed. You're made a child of God. Your mind is transformed to the mind of Christ. Your affections are cleansed 
and turn towards Jesus. And your will is changed so that you seek to do the will of God, which is sanctification. Sanctification, however, is not a gospel concept if it isn't linked with regeneration. So if you hear somebody say, you've got to work hard to be saved, you say, well, wait, wait, wait. what about regeneration? Because regeneration empowers sanctification. You could not sanctify yourself if you weren't first born again. Okay? Being born again leads to sanctification. Sanctification needs regeneration. And glorification is the hope that both regeneration and sanctification together offer to the believer. I think the believer... Every true child of God. There is a sense in which uh, being saved, there is great joy, there is fulfillment, there is contentment, um, there is peace. But I also think deep down inside of every child of God, there is an itch that you can't get to. Do you ever have an itch on your back that you just can't scratch? And, and what is it? I, I want to be like Jesus, but I'm not. I want to be perfectly obedient to God, but I'm not. I want to perfectly reflect God's glory and holiness, but I don't. There's an itch. And I think one of the attractions of heaven to the Christian is that all the good that God has done in me will consume me so that in heaven I will be all that I wanted to be all along. And thus, it's, that's glorification. And we won't go further with it except to say there's, a, there's an extraordinary aspect of that. Glorification, what's the, the root word of glorification? Glory. Glory. And there's nothing weightier than the glory of God. And in glorification, it is God of heaven and earth who, who before the foundation of the world, uh, chose you and, and for whom Christ died and in whom the Holy Spirit came to bring the life of Jesus and gave you new birth and worked in your life through sanctification, that when we get to heaven, we will share in the glory of God. Now that's awesome. I think angels stand amazed that, that God would create a creature who could share His glory and Creatures who rebelled against Him and whom He redeemed, reclaimed, and restored to share in His glory. That's good stuff, my brothers and my sisters. So, how do these words, what do these words have in, in common? Well, these words have in common uh, the saving work of God in human experience, though different aspects of that uh, human experience. And it's really important to, to understand the distinctions of that. However, these three terms, regeneration, sanctification, and glorification, are set apart from justification. Now, we're going to talk about justification next week, if the Lord wills. Um, justification is, ever, is just as central. Uh, a lot of the reformers said that justification was really the core of the gospel uh, that was reclaimed in the 16th century. And that's true. However, I would argue uh, that regeneration, sanctification, and glorification are equally central to the biblical doctrine of the saving work of God. Uh, but uh, these three terms, regeneration, sanctification, and glorification, 
uh, deal with the experience of our humanity in salvation, whereby justification does not. We'll talk about justification next week. I just want you to know that, that justification and then these other three are distinct from each other. And, and we often refer to them as justification, the, the higher work, the work that's in the mind of God, and regeneration, sanctification, and glorification is the lower work, meaning God condescends to bring salvation into human experience. Now, how do these words help us understand the gospel? Well, I think, I think they are helpful to help us understand the gospel, but how so? Well, regeneration helps us to understand the punctiliar nature of the gospel. Punctiliar. When, um, when you and I pray for the lost, uh, when, when I preach and I speak to people uh, about being saved, what am I talking about? I am essentially talking about regeneration. Uh, you must be born again. Uh, that's the punctiliar nature of salvation. That's the dot on the board. They must come to that point where... Uh, and, and usually when Christians talk about, have you been saved? They're talking about this. Uh, now, someone may say, well, wait, I haven't heard you say the word conversion. Uh, well, thank you for asking about that. Um, where does conversion fit in regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Well, conversion deals with regeneration, but in such a fashion as to manifest the presence of regeneration in a human life. Okay, help me unpack that. Okay. Which comes first, or, or are they simultaneous? Regeneration and conversion. If if we were to squeeze it enough to understand the nature of regeneration being the sovereign work of God in grace in which He acts savingly upon a sinner who repents and believes in Christ, we have to then say regeneration precedes conversion. Conversion is the manifestation of of the work of regeneration. So we would describe conversion in these two ways. Repentance of sin. I'm turning from sin. I'm believing on Jesus. That's conversion. How does that conversion occur? It, it occurs because the Holy Spirit has already worked regeneration in the soul. This person, the only reason this person repents of sin and believes on Christ is because they mentally see the gospel and the beauties of Christ. They have a scent, and um, and some of the reformers uh, talked about faith being as many as eight different things, and we'll talk about that somewhere along the line. But we could we could define it at least in three ways. It's a mental assent. That Jesus is the Son of God, He died for sins, and I believe that's how people are saved. But it's also an affectational turn. It, my emotions are turned towards Christ. I love Him now. Well, a sinner doesn't love God, does he? A sinner hates God. Well, how does a sinner become a lover of God? Because a change has occurred in his affections in his soul. That's regeneration. And then the will, every sinner can exercise his or her will to choose any sin they want. But they cannot choose to not sin. So the will is in bondage to sin. It's not free. It's not free to be perfect. It's not free to be righteous. It's, it's free to sin. <laughs> but in regeneration, the Holy Spirit sets not only sets the will free, but empowers the will to choose Christ. Choose faith. Choose to believe on Christ. Therefore, conversion, which is repentance and faith, 
is a manifestation of the work of regeneration, which has already occurred in the soul by the power of God's grace in the work of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So conversion is there, but it's, it's linked to regeneration. It's linked to regeneration. So regeneration helps us understand the gospel in a punctiliar fashion. Sanctification helps us to understand the gospel and salvation in a, in a process. In a process. We are always pressing on to that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And it's important to remember that sanctification is part of your salvation. This may feel funny to us because we talk about it as being punctiliar, a moment in time. But the moment in time in regeneration continues on in process in sanctification. And that's where you would understand the book of Hebrews. If any of you have studied the book of Hebrews, you'll run into passages there with which we are very uncomfortable. That it talks about people who claim to belong to the Lord and fall away. And so how do we deal with that? Well, we deal with that in the standpoint of that which is regeneration also experiences sanctification. Now, sanctification is messy. And we are not perfect. We're in process, right? Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. He's still working on me. But over a period of time, you see the work of divine grace. However, If there is no sanctifying holiness, then Hebrews says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So that's where we shoot down. I prayed to receive Christ in VBS. I've got my ticket. I'm good to go. No. Does your life reflect that profession of faith? If it doesn't, you have no assurance of your salvation. And I think those kind of people are really hard to reach, but that's a whole other issue altogether. So regeneration helps us to see it, see salvation as punctiliar. Sanctification helps us to see it as a process. Glorification helps us to see it as a promise. As a promise. Salvation is punctiliar. It's a process. It's a promise. Uh, There are a number of um, passages of Scripture Uh, two of which (coughs) I really, really like on this. Uh, One is from 1 Thessalonians 5. (coughs) 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And then if you just want to leapfrog, uh, I want to look at uh, the book of Jude. (coughs) Ooh, Jude. Be careful, you'll pass it up real quick. It's a little bitty book. Just before Revelation. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. uh, Paul writes near the end of this first epistle to the Thessalonian Christians. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. <clears throat> so this is the language of glorification, even though the word glorification isn't there. But entire sanctification is glorification. That's the definition of that. So it's the end of the process. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit, soul, and body. There isn't anything left after that. Be preserved, complete, without blame, blamelessness at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's referring to the second coming of Christ. Verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you and he will bring it to pass. Do you see that? This is, this is glorification described as a promise. This is sanctification as a promise. God is doing this for you. And it's going to come. 
Just as surely as you were regenerated. Just as surely as you're being sanctified. He is going to finish that process. And God himself will make you blameless. Spirit, soul, body at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful. He will do it. So don't fight him. Don't fight him. When he leads you through dark valleys, when you go through difficult times, just stick with him. God is working things out for your good. By the way, I think that's what the definition of the word good is in Romans 8, 28. God causes everything to work for good to those who love him and called according to his purpose. What is good is what is holy and glorifying to him. Jude. He ends the little epistle. You don't need to say chapter. It's only one chapter. Verses 24 and 25. Near the end of this little epistle. Now to him who's able. To keep you from stumbling. And to make you stand. In the presence of his glory. Blameless with Great joy. I ought to preach on that. Verse 25. To the only God our Savior. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Before all time. Now and forever. Amen. He's all excited. Because he is refreshing their minds. With this concept that God who called you, God who saved you, God who regenerated you is keeping you from stumbling, keeping you from falling. He is going to make you stand up in His presence, the presence of His glory. I don't know about you, but I want to fall on my face when I'm before His glory. But He's going to make you stand Because you will be blameless with great joy. What is this? This is glorification, y'all. This is the big bang. This is the grand finale of the fireworks. Boom, 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 boom. This is it. God saved you for this. He saved you to make you holy like Him. And to present you In his glory forever and ever. What am I saying? Glorification is salvation as a promise. It's a promise. God is saying, I'm going to do this for you. Wow, doesn't that sound great? So salvation is punctiliar and regeneration. It's a process in sanctification. And it is a process. is is a promise in salvation glorification so let me let me do some summation and and give some uh, final thoughts as we think about the importance of understanding salvation in these in this threefold category as it relates to human experience this this helps us to understand that salvation is of the lord it's from god Salvation is not what we do to ourselves or for ourselves. Salvation is not a goal that we have to achieve. Salvation is God's work in us for His own glory. He gets the credit. Also, understanding salvation in this way helps us understand experientially our struggles as Christians. That's really important. As a pastor, I want you, my sheep, to understand struggles. If you are not struggling to grow as a Christian, something's wrong with you. It is normal. It is natural. It is necessary that you struggle with it. There's sweat. There's toil. There's work. Anybody who wants to be a lazy Christian is not growing. Growth in the Christian life is work. But that's part of your salvation. 
Okay, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Uh, Our rest is in Jesus. And in heaven, we're going to rest for all eternity. But through this life, we will struggle. That involves a lot of things that I don't really have time to talk about. I'll just touch on a few things. This helps us think about this whole idea of the Christian and temptation and sin. Christians can and are tempted. Christians can and do sin. Now someone's going to say, well, wait a minute, I was reading in 1 John, uh, in the first epistle, he says, if you're saved, you don't sin. Uh, Well, I would highly recommend you review your Greek tenses in that book. Because every time uh, John says that, he says it in the type of a verb tense that means A person doesn't continue on and on and on and on in the domination of sin. He's not saying you don't don't sin in a moment of time as a Christian. He's saying the power of sin is broken in your life. And you can't grow in your faith if the power of sin isn't broken. But we still struggle with it, don't we? And and, and we're living in 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 a world... That has declared war against God. You and I are going to face opposition. Because we're Christians. I now believe that you and I will see some. If we live air very long. We're going to see some aspect of that opposition in our life experience. That isn't because God isn't, doesn't love us. That isn't because God has abandoned us. That is going to be part of our salvation. And this helps us understand this whole growth in godliness concept that the New Testament talks about. Uh, where Paul will say, man, put, it, put everything you got. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. He, he uses the Grecian games, the Olympic games. Man, these athletes are working hard. There's training They're eating right. They're getting sleep. They want to be at their top-notch best when they compete. Be like that in your Christian life. That explains that. Why would Paul talk like that? Because that's sanctification in your Christian life. My point is, these terms help us understand the struggles that we'll have in this life. These terms also help us understand the goal of our salvation. What's the goal of our salvation? Well, we might describe it in various ways. Moral perfection is one. Even regeneration helps us with that. Because in regeneration, we lose our ability to enjoy our sin. Moral rectitude. We are now rewired to love purity and hate ungodliness. Because we are going to go to heaven where we will be morally pure. Uh, Also, the goal includes eternal joy. The longer I live, the more I'm going to talk about this. As a pastor, the Christian faith is about human joy in Christ. Joy. Uh, Jude uh, talked about that, didn't he? And I, I think that was very remarkable. To him who's able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. Jesus would say in the Gospel of John to his disciples, my joy I give to you. It's about joy, but it's joy in Christ. I will argue there is no joy in sin. There's a thrill in sin. There's a certain temporary satisfaction in sin. But there's no eternal joy in sin. Because of its destructive qualities. And the goal of our salvation is the glory of God. Certainly God gets the credit for our salvation. But we in. This is an amazing concept. We in our intrinsic eternal existence. When we get to heaven. Our very existence will beam the glory of God. I don't know how that all will happen. Only I know it will happen. Um, I'll just pass 
uh, by this one thing and just leave it with you to think about it. But I think it's in this context that we can best understand the New Testament use of the law in the Christian's life. Uh, 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 Christianity will argue, a basic Christianity will argue, that the law of God is not dispensed with in the New Testament Christian's life. Nor does the law become the instrumental means by which we are saved. Well, then what is the use of the law in the Christian's life in the New Testament? It is that it becomes our guide and compass to the holiness of God, the will, the moral will of God. It protects us when we're tempted and it rebukes us when we sin and convicts us of sin. This is the use of the law of God in the New Testament Christian's life, helping us understand sanctification. Now, I just have a few moments left. I want to close by posing a question and answering in, in a variety of ways. How have people sometimes misunderstood these terms? A regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Well, some people deny one or more of these terms. I know of a, an entire Christian denomination who basically doesn't deal with sanctification at all. Uh, they make a lot of justification. That's great. But this is a good example. You, you cannot take one truth and deny other truths. You cannot take one truth and make one truth everything. You, it takes different terms taken together to reflect different parts of the whole of salvation. So you can't deny one. You can't just say, I believe in regeneration and I deny sanctification. You can't take sanctification as just doing better without thinking about being regenerated. You can't deny one or more of these terms. We can't misunderstand the meaning of these terms. <clears throat> I think, for example, in regeneration, you can't deny the miraculous nature of it. And I think Baptists uh, have made a career in misunderstanding regeneration. And I talk about this a lot. And I think the reason I do is because I've blown it so much in my life. I'm, I'm persnickety about it. Um, I, early in my pastoral work, thought if I could get people to walk down the aisle, I could get more people saved. If I could, if I could convince them to pray the sinner's prayer, I could get them saved. And I, come, I have come to repent of that in my life. Salvation is of the Lord. We're like Catholics. We have made walking an aisle a sacrament. And I've talked to many, many people. Are you saved? I've walked the aisle. Wait a minute. Where's that in Romans? Where's that in John? Where's that in Ephesians? It's not. Man came up with that. So you've, th this is a denial of regeneration. It, it is a work, it is a sovereign work of God using the truths of the gospel taught in biblical text to open the eyes, open the heart, and open the will and bring a person to Jesus Christ. And when God does that, you can't stop Him from doing it. Even if I preach on stewardship. If God's going to save, He's going to save. We cannot misunderstand how these terms connect. Sometimes people do that. I've tried to make that uh, fit. And, and we cannot misunderstand the role of grace in all of this. Grace shows up all the way through. When Paul says in Ephesians 2, you're saved, twice he says it, you're saved by grace. He means all of those terms. You're regenerated by grace, you're sanctified by grace, and you're glorified by grace. Now, as I've indicated several times tonight, we're going to pick up justification next week and try to differentiate between these three. If someone were to ask you this question on a final exam, what's the difference between justification intrinsically? What's the difference between justification and regeneration, sanctification, glorification? What would you say? You would say, Sanctification, regeneration, sanctification, and glorification all deal with human experience in salvation. 
Justification has to do with God's mind and his change of perspective on us based on what Christ did for us. And then, of course, you'd be right. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your saving grace and for the awesomeness of your saving work in regeneration, sanctification, glorification. Most all of us here tonight have been regenerated and we are supremely joyful that that has happened. We're also, those of us who are regenerated are being sanctified and we pray that by your grace you would support us as we continue to grow in our faith and we who have been regenerated and are growing in our faith and sanctification look forward to the day when you call us home and our bodies are raised from the grave and we are complete for all eternity sharing in the beauties of your holiness we pray that you would Cause us to value this great salvation that you have purchased at the cost of your son on the cross. The salvation that you're giving to us even now. Help us to live in the joy and the light of the glory of that great salvation. Thank you for this evening. Bless us as we think further about it. In Christ's name we pray.